Hey, it's Jeff Hyman, your startup therapist, where we focus on the people part of startups, and I'm with Troy Hanikoff. Hi, Troy. How are you, Jeff? I'm great. It's good to spend time with you again. We appreciate it. Troy, you are um, a very interesting individual to, to speak with entrepreneurs uh, because you've sat in so many seats. You've started companies, you've built them, you've sold them. Now you're an investor, so you fund them. You work with entrepreneurs in so many ways. You even teach entrepreneurship at the Kellogg School in Chicago. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, let me give just a, a brief setup, and then our focus today is going to be from the perspective of your current situation as an investor, you're, you're with multiple venture groups, mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make, things that you think entrepreneurs should be thinking about as they build their startups, not just with regard to raising money, but especially with regard to building a company, building a fruitful culture, etc. So that's sure. going to be our topic today for about 15 minutes or so. Uh, but let me just let people know who you are because you've done a ton of amazing things from uh, just hopping around. You've been involved in starting Sure Payroll, which is one of Chicago's most successful technology stories that became, I believe, the biggest uh, independent payroll company in the country for small businesses. Does that sound about right? We're the largest internet payroll company. Internet payroll in the company. Uh, Paychex and ADP, obviously, uh, there you go. were significantly larger and were acquired by Paychex in 2011. You also were involved in OneWed, which was a very early successful online wedding company. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you teach at Kellogg. You're now involved with two kind of venture uh, groups. One is your partner uh, with uh, Math Venture Partners, which is a relatively new but very successful up-and-coming venture fund in Chicago. I think you've raised about, what, $28 million or so? Correct. Uh, so it's a good size fund. And then you're also managing director of Techstars, a uh, Chicago program in the Midwest, where you have a whole new crop of, what, 10 companies at a time? 10 companies every year. We've done it for six years, so we have 60 alumni companies. Got it. So to say that you see a lot of startups and you've seen a lot of things is uh, an understatement. Yep. So with that uh, set up, why don't I throw out the first question, which is, um, how? What, what's been your biggest observation transitioning from entrepreneur to investor that you think uh, entrepreneurs should know, uh, biggest mistake that you see them make, the most common movie you see over and over and over that you think can make a real difference for founders? Sure, and this is actually part of the investment thesis for Math Venture Partners. So we see entrepreneurs all the time, and generally the entrepreneurs are really smart people who really understand the problem. They usually have great technology skills. They can produce a solution and they feel like, I've built this thing, I've got a company. <laughs> and what you really have is a product. And in order to have a company, you need to have customers. And so many entrepreneurs believe that if they build it, the customers will come. And the reality is they won't. And, what, and this is so obvious, at least to me now, that it almost sounds stupid saying it out loud, but so many entrepreneurs miss the fact that it's those companies that have an unfair advantage in customer acquisition that are the ones that have outsized returns and are successful. Even if your product or service is not the best, right. yep. if you have a really good go-to-market strategy. So, Troy, what's an example of an unfair advantage when it comes to uh, a, a distribution strategy or go-to-market strategy? Right. So when we were building Sure Payroll, what our unfair advantage was, was our partnership with Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo Bank had more online banking small business customers than anybody else in the country at the time. This was 2000. And what they did was they had realized that, that payroll, if their banking customers ran payroll with them, and this was before we were involved, they did it legacy, mainframe based. People would actually walk into the bank to pick up their paychecks to hand to their employees. Right. That got them in the bank every single week. And those customers stayed with the bank longer. They had more on deposit. There was less churn. There were better customers. So when Wells Fargo went online, they said, oh, how do we do this? We have online customers. They can't come to our bank branches. I know. We'll do online payroll. Right. And we at Sure Payroll powered that. And Wells Fargo had a sales organization of 55 salespeople who were in the field selling to their banking customers so already. You, so you plug directly into that distribution channel. I assume it was an exclusive relationship. Uh, it, it was not an exclusive relationship. Didn't even have to be and it was still successful. Right. We ultimately had partnerships with many other banks. But no, I meant from their perspective. Were you oh, their... From their perspective, yes. Got it. On the online. We're their exclusive online provider. Got it. So, and, yeah. and the interesting thing about that is when, when you get a phone call and someone says, hey Jeff, 
this is your banker from Wells Fargo Bank, and you bank at Wells Fargo Bank, you take that phone call 100% of the time. Right. So it was like shooting fish in a barrel for them to get the sales meetings to sell them on the payroll solution. So I'm inferring a little bit, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. The, the magic there was that you got borrowed credibility from Wells Fargo with their customers. As a startup, no one had ever heard of Sure Payroll. What the hell is Sure Payroll? But immediately, you got borrowed credibility from Wells Fargo with their customers. And, and are you saying that can be a big differentiator, uh, a big unfair advantage for a startup because you have no brand awareness? Well, what happened was they were actually selling it. We white labeled it to them. So they're selling it under their own brand, got Online it. Payroll by Wells Fargo, which was a horrible URL, but that's what they called it. <laughs> but they had enough of a relationship, it didn't matter what their URL was. And, and then that got us revenue and got us sales and got us going. And then when we would call up with our own inside sales call up people, and they'd say, well, I've never heard of you. We'd say, oh, go look at Wells Fargo. Got it. See how that site is? The same? See, they chose us. Got it. And so we, that's where we leveraged the credibility and borrowed brand from them. So that becomes your kind of your beachhead account, and then you can spread out from there. Yep. So if I'm a founder of a relatively new company, and to your point earlier, I've developed this product or service. It's amazing. I think the whole world's going to bang down my door, and they don't. What do I do? How do I begin to shift gears, or is it too late by that point, to start to put in place a, a sales and marketing unfair advantage? Yeah, so we look for teams and companies that have sales and marketing baked into their DNA. And so where someone on the founding team has that in their, literally, in their bones. So if you and I take a new product, we're co-founders in this hypothetical business. Yeah, should only have, I should be so lucky to be your co-founder. And we've got this great new product. Um, and uh, if we hire an outside sales rep, someone who we hire to come in and sell our product, and, and that person fails to sell this, what are we going to do? Right. We're going to fire that person. They didn't sell. Sure. But if you go out and try to sell it, and you can't sell it, what do we do? Oh, we do there's a problem. Them? There's a problem with the product. Sure. And as a founder, you have control, and you have the ability to come back and say, hey, Troy, we got a problem with our product. Here's what I'm hearing from the customer. Here's right. what I have to do. And getting to that product market fit only happens when you're out in the field and you're talking to customers. And the only way you're doing that is if you're really focused on sales. And so we're looking for companies like that. And now if you take that sales DNA and you leverage on top of it, a you put on top of it a, a leveraged sales model. So I'll give you another example. A company we invested in here in Chicago called Now Secure. So real quickly at a high level, it's mobile security. And so they have a little app that you could load on your uh, phone that will tell you whether or not you're connecting securely, encrypted passwords, sending data to China, all that kind of stuff, right? And they sell to CIOs and CTOs who are managing infrastructure in large companies because the easiest vector to hack into a corporate website is through mobile. Think about all the apps you have on this device that's connecting sure. to the corporate sure. infrastructure. Sure. And nobody knows what those are. So and they'll sell it to the CIO who will require that in order to connect to our servers, you have to have now secure on your phone. This is for the employees. And then he gets a dashboard and he gets to say, I'll only let people who are at a security level of 90 or above in. And so if you're below 90, it'll tell you what you have to do to fix it. And, and it's a great tool for that CIO. So what's the unfair but advantage? Here's the unfair advantage. So they now secure software is scanning hundreds of thousands, if not millions of apps every single day. And they're finding the vulnerabilities. And so then when they find the vulnerability, let's hypothetically be clear as hypothetically say it's uh, Citibank yeah. has a vulnerability. They then go to Citibank on the other side and they say, hey, Citibank, we know you have three vulnerabilities in your app. By the way, we have this other piece of software Got it. that can help you solve that problem. Got it. And so one side of their business is doing lead gen for the other side of their business. So, so that's a good, it's a fascinating example. If I'm a founder, maybe with a product background or a technical background, how do I even begin to think about and come up with this unfair advantage. It would seem like I need to go to Harvard and be an MBA and have no, strategy no. and all that stuff. I'm assuming that's not the case. No, not the case. And most typically it happens because of relationships and people who've been inside a particular industry. So one of the companies that went through Techstars this year is called Infinicene. Stu Grubbs, the CEO, has been in the gaming industry for a dozen years. He has deep relationships with people at Twitch, Major League Gaming, NVIDIA, all of these folks. And so out of the gate, he had 
an in in all of these companies. Twitter. So my Rolodex could be an unfair advantage. Oh my God, is it an unfair advantage when it's relationship selling like that, like doing biz dev? That's amazing. So if I'm a 23-year-old founder right out of school, do I bring in a senior biz dev person who brings a Rolodex with them? Or do I say, that's not going to work and I shouldn't pick that as the unfair advantage? Well, I think that you it would be valuable for you to have a co-founder who has some sort of unfair advantage. could be inside knowledge into the industry, could be a um, you know prior relationships, could be um, has built something like this before. So I'll give you... Uh, another one that we invested in a company called CardFlight, which is selling credit card processing solutions. But instead of selling directly to the end merchants, what they do is they sell to what are called the ISOs, independent sales organizations. They solve a particular problem for the ISOs around mobile credit card processing. So they sign up an ISO, and that ISO goes out and sells to 50 merchants every month. I see. And then they sign up another ISO, and that guy sells to 100 merchants every month. So, and then they sell. So, if Cardflight doesn't sign up another another ISO, they're still going to get a thousand new merchants every month from here forward. The examples that you've given so far, Troy, seem to me to fall under a category of channels. You're tapping into existing channels. Is that is that what you mean by unfair advantage, or is that just one example of an unfair advantage? I guess that's just one example, and it's probably the most common example. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of other tangible companies that we've seen that have uh, a different kind of unfair advantage. I guess um, it could be a consumer marketing approach where you're piggybacking on some other offer or some other product or service. Well, so like even here's another one in gaming, another company, GameWest, that was from the class of 2014. And they provide services to streamers uh, who are streaming their games on Twitch and that sort of thing. And what happens is when they sign up a streamer, that streamer starts out with a relatively small revenue stream from them because they have relatively few gamer watchers, subscribers who have subscribed to their platform. They're out marketing it because they want more subscribers, more revenue, right? And again, as GameWisp adds more streamers, each of those streamers is adding more customers or, or viewers and again it's an n squared kind of yeah, curve yeah. and so they don't sell everyone. You'll notice also by the way most of these that I've described are recurring revenue models. I love recurring revenue models. For but, those that don't understand that concept what what defines recurring revenue? I think a lot of people use different definitions. Yeah so for me recurring revenue means that you have a set of customers who are signing up to pay you monthly, sometimes it's yearly, but whatever, on a recurring basis, and it's it doesn't even have to be a firm contract necessarily. It could be good till canceled or whatever. Right. The default behavior is we're going to charge that credit card again next month, right. or in sure payroll's case, we're going to process your payroll and take it out of your bank account yep. via ACH. Yep. And so the beauty of a recurring revenue model is you do a bunch of work to get some customers, and you start the next month with that much revenue, right. and then you add some more. They layer o over time. As right. long as you don't have a lot of attrition, people falling out of the bottom of the bathtub faster than coming in. Which is what we call churn. Right. And churn is the thing that people forget about when they're building these. Right. Because even in the payroll business where we had churn, uh, our average customer lasted about seven years, um, but we ended up with between 15 and 20% churn annually. That doesn't sound like a lot until you have 50,000 customers. You're going to lose 10,000 customers right. just naturally. A bunch of them go out of business. Yeah. That means you need a sales force to replace them. Get you ten thousand yeah. new customers yeah. just to tread water and stay even. So, so in the in the early stages of a business, and I know this is a tough question to answer, but roughly, is there a churn number per month or per year that tells me that I've got a healthy recurring model because my churn is relatively low? At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is your customer acquisition cost and your lifetime value. Again, this is one of those things that sounds silly to say out loud, but your customer acquisition cost has to be less than okay. your lifetime value. Okay, how about the ratio of those two? Is there Have you learned something about a ratio? So what I like is when, so most of these lifetime values come over time. So this is what's deceptive. So in the payroll business, it would cost us all in with commission and everything, call it $1,000 to get a customer. And that customer, we would get, call it $100 a month in revenue. Right. If that those numbers were correct, we would pay back in 10 months. We'd be profitable before the first year, yep. and they'd stay for six more years. Yep. As long as you had enough runway, enough cash in the bank that you could survive that 10 months, right. you would plant a dollar in the ground, and it would come back 
and be a dollar at the end of 10 months, and at the end of the 20 months, it'll be $2, and the 30 it'll be $3. That's right. a great business. One of the challenges is cash flow, as it is in all startups, and the longer that period of yeah. payback is, the more challenging it is. Anything under a year, if you have a good ultimate multiple of customer acquisition cost to lifetime value, a three, a four, a five, yep. and you get paid back your initial investment in less than a year. Then it tends to work. Those are generally kind of. good businesses. Well, how does that pertain to something that a lot of people ask me about, which is apps? So they're so excited. They've got the best new app. It's going to be, it's going to change the world. Uh, has the app model basically pivoted to it's got to be free and then a recurring monthly charge? Are you seeing that or can you still be successful with just an app? Yeah, well, some apps, you know, you buy once. It's not a recurring revenue model. Your consumers buy once and that's it. Many apps have gone to a monthly charge. So we've had companies, we had uh, an exercise with its work it. They're actually on a freemium model, but those who pay, pay, I don't know, it's $2.99, $3.99 a month. Um, those apps tend to have much higher churn than payroll. Right. right. How many people, nobody has ever paid for an app for seven years because nobody's sure. had apps for seven right, years. Right, right, right. Such a new marketplace. But there's much higher churn, which what that means is your customer acquisition cost has to be much lower. So, sure, if you can, you know, acquire customers for three dollars and they pay you two ninety nine and on average stay for three months, yeah, it's a three to one return. That's probably all right. Got it. Um, but the it, it's much harder. But you have to be really careful and, and look at churn on those. For the last couple of minutes, I want to bridge to the the talent or people-related implications of all this. So whether I'm a founder, co-founder, et cetera, uh, how does all of this factor into what how I should be spending my time, what kind of people I should be recruiting, building the startup in the early phases? Uh, you've talked a lot about customer acquisition and, 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 and go-to-market and unfair advantage, a little less about the product and the service. How do I know when I should, it's the product is good enough, now I gotta spend some of my time or all of my time or recruit ahead of sales. How do I begin to even think about that? Yeah, so I believe that product is never done, it's a journey. And I believe in the lean startup, very iterative model. So when I talk about customer acquisition and I talk about product market fit, implicit in that is you're killing yourself to iterate on the product, iterate on the product, make it better, and you're measuring everything. So one of the things I love to tell our entrepreneurs is that everything you do should be a twofer. It's always got to be a twofer. What do you mean by you move, that? You move the business forward and you learn at the same time. It's not good enough that you put out a product and you said, I'm pricing it at $4.99 and you got a bunch of sales. Was $4.99 the right price? So everything is a test. Should, everything should be a test? Exactly. Okay. Should it have been higher or lower? So I would put that out at two different price points. I'd move the product, the company forward by getting revenue right. and learn about pricing. Got it. So every single thing you do should move the product and company forward and make you smarter about the marketplace as well. And so on the product side, you're always iterating and you're always changing. And it should be the same on the sales and marketing side. Yeah, absolutely. So, and A-B testing your pitch and A-B testing pricing and A-B testing contract. Do I get them to do an LOI first and kind of get them locked in? If it's a, if it's a longer term enterprise sale and then go to contract? Or is that extra step slowing it down so I go contract first? If I'm in so relatively testing, early... Testing. If I'm a relatively early stage company or a brand new company, how do I do A-B testing when my my absolute number is so small? I thought I, I thought A-B testing, you really need a st statistically significant number to measure those two. How do I do it when no one's heard of me? I have no website traffic. I have no downloads. So there's different kinds of A-B testing. There's A-B testing you do with a product like Optimizely where you're formally doing it and you're looking at numbers and statistics, which is the best. But I'm out there. So when... I'll give you an example. We were raising money for our fund, Math Venture Partners. We A-B tested our pitch. So how did you do that? That, that doesn't mean that we had a website and we we're collecting you know, millions of uh, impressions. What it means is we went into a pitch with an investor and we said, all right, we're going to try pitch A and see how it goes. Yeah. Then we get feedback and we realize, ah, oh, they didn't understand our point of differentiation. We're going to lead with differentiation the next time. So then we lead with differentiation a couple times and we see how that goes. So it can be, I call this mother-in-law research. It doesn't have to be 
perfect. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. As long as you're oh, learning absolutely. and iterating. Absolutely. It's one of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make, especially first time entrepreneurs, is exactly as you said, they make perfect the enemy of good. Yeah. And so what happens is the product never gets out, they don't learn enough. Right. And you're much better off pushing something out that is not quite ready for the market, getting feedback and learning, because the odds are you don't know it. You don't have it right yeah. anyway. Yeah. And so making perfect when it's perfect in the wrong direction is actually counterproductive. Right. Rather get something out that's just good enough that you'll get the feedback. And people use the term MVP, minimally viable product, I think incorrectly. Most of them think that MVP means version 1.0. I actually think that you have a series of specific and different MVPs. Each one is what is minimally viable in order to test this particular That thing. particular feature or whatever. I want to yeah. get an MVP out because I want to test pricing. And so you do that and you iterate through price and you say, I want another MVP where I want to test user interface yep. and I want to test conversion funnel and Got I it. want to test. And so there are a series of different MVPs, each one that has a specific numeric measurable goal. And you're sequencing them from most important to least. So it's Absolutely. like when you fill, when you fill a, a fishbowl or an aquarium, you put in the big rocks first and then the little rocks. Is that yes. kind of how, how to do it? Yeah. So. A, I believe that what gets measured gets done. So everything everything you should have objective numericals. An MVP is not, we put out something to see what customer acquisition will be. Of course you're going to get some customers. You'll That's a successful test because you'll have seen. The real way to do it is say, I put out an MVP to see if I convert 1% of my visitors into paying users. Got it. If you got 0 .9999, that was a failure. Yeah. If you got 1.001, it was a success. Right. But have a specific measurable goal. So your other point what I do whenever I hear a business plan or a pitch is I think in my head, sometimes I go to the whiteboard and I start writing down all of the risks. And then I rank order them. And I say, what is the biggest risk? What's the second biggest risk? And then the next thing I do is how can I create a quick test to cheaply and inexpensively prove that this is no longer a risk? And right? take it off the table. Check it off. And then I check the next one off and the next one and the next one. It, you will always have risk in your business. Right. But once you get those big risks off the table, you feel confident that now I can dive in. I can put a bunch of time and money behind this and, and give it a go. So is it true that the entrepreneur from a venture perspective, an investor like you, isn't it true that an entrepreneur is rewarded for taking risk out of the business? You're more interested in investing, maybe at a higher valuation, if I can prove that I've taken those big risks out of the business. So and it becomes more of just execution risk. Am I going to screw up the execution? People think of venture capitalists as big risk takers. And the truth is that the successful ones are good at mitigating risk in an inherently risky environment. And the reason that you have to fund the first part of your business with your own credit card is there are just too many risks yeah. on it. Yeah. And then the next part might be friends and family who are willing to take risks because they believe in you personally. They may not even understand your business. Right. And then angels, you know, they may like your mission. They may like you. They might. And by the time you get to venture, hopefully you've take you've used that capital to take a bunch of those big risks off the table. So now it is de-risked enough. And by the way, at a higher valuation yeah. now. Yeah. That the venture guys are willing to come in. And start to play and that's why we do this in steps fantastic is there one book you would recommend in closing for entrepreneurs that you just think is a, is a must read there's uh, so many but is there one around this topic of kind of how to scale the business how to think about raising money at different stages and well so the one about thinking about risk and how to mitigate risk is obviously the lean startup yep. by eric reese so it's all about how do i quickly and inexpensively test this stuff and i I believe that what Eric did beautifully was take the things that successful entrepreneurs were already doing. So that book came out in 2011, yeah. I believe, September of 2011. In 2000, we were doing smoke sure. screen tests. He just put a framework tests. around it and words around it. We didn't know to call them yeah. that, but yeah. that's what we were doing. Yeah. That's and great. he did an amazing job. So if you're starting a business and you haven't read The Lean Startup, that's you great. should go out and get it today awesome. and absolutely do it. If you talked about fundraising, clearly the book... Um, uh, on fundraising is Brad Feld's book, yeah. um, Venture, Deals, Venture Deals, yeah, which just does a really nice job of laying out the various types of vehicles you can use to fund your business, what you should look for, what you shouldn't. And he believes, as do I, having a better educated entrepreneur yeah. makes it smoother to get a deal done. Because you're speaking on the same language. You're seeing it from right. the same lens. Right. Troy, this has been fantastic. Thank you for spending the time with us. How can people learn more about... Tech stars about math venture partners who are getting in touch with you. 
Sure. So obviously Techstars is just techstars.com. We ha now have well over 25 programs running around the globe. Um, it's phenomenal. I think we'll have, uh, I, can't, I can't even come up with what the number is. I think we're going to have close to 300 companies go through our program wow. this year. Mm. And then there's the whole startup weekend piece, which we recently merged with Up Global. So techstars.com has all the information on that. Obviously, Math Venture Partners is at mathventurepartners.com. And, uh, and then you can follow me on Twitter. I'm just at Troy Hennikoff and uh, happy to chat. Great. Troy, thank you so much. It's been incredibly helpful. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. See you soon.